Hello there. Um, we're very pleased to introduce Eduardo Corral. Hello. Um, the 13th in the series of the <laughs> Unumuna author series. Unlucky for some. Unlucky for some, yeah. <laughs> and lucky for us. Uh, um, just quickly introduce Eduardo, and then afterwards we're going to ask him some questions, and he's going to read you the poem. So, Eduardo Corral uh, studied at Arizona State University, and his first collection, Slow Lightning, uh, was the Young, Yale Younger Poet Prize winner. Um, he recently won the Hodder Fellowship from Princeton, and he teaches at North Carolina State University. Yes. And that's all correct. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> you, got it, you got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, so, we'll just ask a couple of questions before uh, you read a poem. And the first question is, um, obviously, you're here in Spain, yeah. and you're a Latino. Uh, mm -hmm. Poet, writing in English. So we thought maybe to ask you to talk about uh, the confluence of the two languages in your poetry and maybe the influence of Spanish poetry on your writing. Okay. You know, so uh, my parents are from a Mexican background, so I grew up speaking Spanish. Spanish is my mother tongue. That said, uh, I grew up in an English-only education in Arizona, so uh, most of my Spanish was, Spanish was educated out of me. So my Spanish level was pretty conversational often say, you know, if you place me in a Mexican university, I'd be like lost, but I'm perfect at a Taco Bell. <laughs> right? yeah. So yeah, it's very conversational. Uh, but I didn't start using code switching, when shuttling back from English and Spanish in my work for the longest time, um, because I was a terrible student, uh, a, a, a terrible graduate student, because I was trying to impress my, te my teachers and peers with my poems, and none of them, none of them spoke Spanish, so I didn't mm. think of, of using Spanish in my work. After graduate school, I was just walking one day and, and thinking the way I usually think. A thought begins in English and ends in Spanish, or even at the phrasal level when I speak, you know, I'm always mixing the languages. I just thought to myself, why can't I write a poem that mimics, parallels, echoes the way I think? Right? And that was a huge breakthrough for me. And that's when I started writing these code switching poems, uh, when I use Spanish, incorporate Spanish into the poem itself. But the Spanish has to happen organically in the drafting process. I'm writing a line or a stanza, and the next words, uh, syllables come in Spanish. Fine, that's organic. That's part of the drafting process, right? In the revision process, I, the Spanish stays in or, or, or is taken out, right? But the process tells me it came organically, so it's part of the poem, part of the fabric of the poem. I'm not a big fan of what I call ethnic embellishment, when writers from a specific ling linguistic minority just add their language to the poem to suggest to otherness or strangeness. I, I call that ethnic embellishment, right? But Spanish has to be part of the musical imagistic structure of the poem. It has to fully work. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and do, they have, do you have some sort of, uh, does your Spanish, therefore, if you have conversational Spanish, I'll talk about Spanish. <laughs> does it, um, does it... Uh, Let's not go with talk about Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like um, it. Yeah, well, it could work. Um, the next book, though. Um, so, is there a way in which um, do you find that your Spanish certain articulates certain ideas, or often has certain reference points that come out in Spanish more than in English? I n not in my poetry per se, per, per se, but in my personal life, my interior life, uh, my extreme emotions uh, take up a Spanish grammar, take up a Spanish diction, right? Uh, when I'm heartbroken or ecstatic. Uh, I feel those things in Spanish, right? I cannot articulate it inside of myself in Spanish, right? Um, maybe I don't see that yet in the work, yeah, but in, personally, in, in my interior, that's how it happens to me, right? Uh, those extreme emotions from happiness to extreme sadness, uh, I felt I articulate in Spanish. Right? Okay. Um, Which I think I had come to sense, even my mother's name is Socorro. Uh, that's a, a, a Spanish word for help, ayuda, socorro, socorro means help, help, right? So even that maternal root, uh, it's a, an extreme emotion, right? A call for help. So. Thank you. Um, the second and last question really is that we have a, a lot of younger writers and poets who yeah. come to our events and who look, yeah. watch our videos online. And I just maybe you could talk a little bit about the process of becoming a poet and becoming a teacher of poetry and if any had any advice for younger writers or anything that you were told that you thought, wow, that was invaluable to me. Yeah. I think the first task of a young poet or emerging writer is to, is to listen, to learn how you pay attention to the world, right? You, you, in a in sense, develop a creative practice based on attentiveness. How attentive are you to the language around you? How attentive are you to your own memories? How attentive are you to your daily interactions with others and with yourself, right? Pay attention to the world, right? 
And once you start paying attention to your world, to your thoughts, to your own language, you see patterns emerge, right? And these patterns are the beginnings of your subject matter, right? Certain words or dictions will come back to you. Certain memories, snippets of memories occur, come back to you again and again, right? So pay attention to the world uh, and note what comes back to you again and again. These patterns are your stories, are your poems. And if you want to be a teacher of poetry, I would suggest read widely as possible. For me, as an American poet, I read across all aesthetics camps, uh, international poetry, uh, uh, modern contemporary historical poetry, because you never know what your student is going to need in, in the future, right? So one of your students might need Ron Silliman, another student might need Ted Hughes, right? So you never know what they might need, so read widely. And to come back to the, my first part of the answer about a creative process rooted in attentiveness, I think that's the greatest gift I can give to my MFA students, my students who are studying poetry, is for help them develop their own practice of paying attention. How do they listen to the world? Because they could take that outside the MFA world, outside graduate school, right? It could help them nourish them and carry them through anxiety of doubt when it comes to writing, right? Okay, you're a writer not only when you're at the desk or when you're publishing, but you're also a writer in the world paying attention, right? That's the root of my creative practice, right? I'm a poet because I pay attention. Thank you. Do you want to stop the video there and then we'll do another video for the poem just because we want to cut them up a little bit?